the relationship with the sponsor is just so much more important when you're pitching remotely, I think, because you, you've, you can't read the room, you can't get all the information that right. you used to get in the face-to-face -face solution uh, situation, right? You, you can't read people's, you can't read Fred's body language. who's the CFO over there in the, you know, in the, in the far corner of the table, you can't see how he's leaning back and crossing his arms when you, when you right. come to one point. So you have to have your, your sponsor uncover this information uh, for you. They've already got the rapport uh, built with these people. Uh, and you might not be able to get the same relationship in place today that you were able to get, you know, when you could take everybody out for a steak dinner, right? So, but right. The, the sponsor already has that relationship with these people. Welcome to the Sales Wolves Podcast. I am the host, Joseph Caldwell. I've got a special guest with me today, Steve Benson. And I am excited to get into this and talk with him about the different things he has going on. Very unique perspective this gentleman has. So um, we're going to be discussing actions startup CEOs need to take in a down economy, which we have all seen over the last 18 months for real. And, um, and so as we go through these Sales Wolves podcasts, I appreciate every single person that that uh, takes the time to listen. And we're dedicated to bringing information that will impact you in your career on a daily basis. And, uh, and so if, if, if you're watching this podcast and, and it's added even one tiny little bit of information that you've been able to use or perspective that has shifted something for you that has been helpful, then uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button and, um, and we will get on about it because I want to talk to this man. I want to hear what he has to say. Um, Steve's the founder and CEO of Budget. I mean, uh, Badger Maps, sorry. Badger Maps is the number one app for helping salespeople not get lost in the minutia of sales. Would that be a good way to say it? Yeah, that, that's a great way to describe what we do. That's incredible, man. So, man, I want. Why don't you? Uh, why don't you start off by just telling everybody a little bit more about yourself and and why and how you came up with uh, with Badger Maps? Well, um, so I guess a little bit about me. I grew up in Chicago. Um, I started the company because I had a background in field sales, and then I was working at Google in field sales, and I was also working a lot with mobile products and their mapping products. And, uh, and I, and I realized I, I was kind of, I had, I knew a lot about the problems that field salespeople face. And I believed that as the world was moving towards mobile, this is about 10 years ago. So the iPhone was pretty new. Um, right. as the, as the world was moving towards mobile technology, I, I, I recognized that a map based, um, platform would be really helpful for field salespeople on their mobile device. And, uh, so that's kind of how we started. We started out doing simple things like putting it, putting your territory on a map on your phone so you can see where, where are your customers and kind of colorize them by, by type of customer. And then from there, we got kind of got into the whole, um, schedule building, territory management, route building, um, a bunch of basically doing a bunch of difficult things that, that, uh, field salespeople need done every day, but they historically haven't had a way to do them. And that. That is so fascinating, Hudson. I'm fairly sure if we brought our IT guy in here, that's what we we use. Whatever you came up with at Google, that's what we integrated into our 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 own homegrown. We built a CRM, and it's all based around the map, so that people mm -hmm. are efficient with their time. So we're probably using what you were coming up with ten years ago. <laughs> well, it, yeah, and and you know anyone. Anyone has access to mapping APIs and routing yep. APIs, and we've just really built out a, a a whole a whole suite of software products on the phone for for field salespeople. So yeah, I mean, if you guys built a, and a lot of CRMs have a map in them, mm -hmm. um, you can you connect us to a CRM. In fact, um, so you can, if you you can take your CRM homegrown or or a CRM that is purchased, mm -hmm. and you can take the two and make them have them work together. So the data is being passed back and forth. Uh, there's a, a lot of times one challenge with CRM systems is that they don't get used enough by salespeople because salespeople are on the move. And, um, 
And so having something like Badger, which is kind of inherently built from the ground up to be on the move with um, and connecting it to your CRM is you, we funnel a ton of information back to your CRM throughout the day. That is fascinating. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about that offline. I bet you I could learn a, learn a few things and, uh, cause there's inherently there's things that we haven't been able to do. And I bet you, you already know the answer to the questions I don't even know to ask yet because you've, that's what you do. So <laughs> that's very that's, possible. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to share, man, for sure. That's really cool. And, and that brings me to something else as, as, as we're talking about things that startup CEOs need to actions they need to do in a down economy. Um, I, I'm excited to hear where you're going with that and the different things that you're going to share. But what I just did made me think of, made me think of that, which was a lot of CEOs, a lot of people in my position, they need to get comfortable knowing that they don't know and being open to not knowing, being open to, to looking like, like as soon as, as soon as you started talking, I was like, Oh, this guy's what I, what I've been stumbling through. He, he laid the groundwork for over the last 10 years. I can't wait to talk with him further. I can't wait to have a friendship with him. You know what I'm saying? So we can learn from each other, but knowing what you don't know, that's a good thing for startup CEOs to be able to do. And I don't know if that made your list, but I just thought about, thought about that. But what are some of the challenges, man? I want to hear from you. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree with you. It's, uh, an attitude of curiosity and being humble is so important and for salespeople or for a, a leader of, of a startup or any organization or really anything. Because I, I think if you come at things from the perspective of I'm an expert in lots of things and I'm, I'm the best at stuff, then you can't learn from other people and, and no one's the best at much, right? We're, if, if you're lucky, you really know a lot about two or three things in the whole world. but. Right. There's an expert in everything, and and uh, the crazy thing about the modern world is you kind of have expert a- access to those people or or things they've written, or things they've spoken about, and so I think the you know the best leaders are the ones that uh, are, are the ones that, that that seek out when they have a challenge or or a problem they seek out what uh, you know someone who is truly an expert. But to your to your question, like what what are the what are the challenges that someone a sales leader or a, or a, a leader of a business faces in, in a bad economy um, as opposed to a good one. What are the challenges and kind of what can you do about it? I guess the biggest challenge that come, comes to mind for me is, is your competitors changing their behavior because they're in desperate times or difficult times in a way that's going to hurt your business. So what, you know, I'm talking about things that salespeople encounter all the time, right? Like deep discounting, um, your competitors liquidating their inventory just to make ends meet. Your competitors giving away things like free consulting or free, free goodies, uh, other things to steal your customers away from you to beat you in deals. But really, with business, with behavior that's unsustainable, that they won't be able to sustain over the long term. But that they'll, you know, because you, you, you can only liquidate your inventory at, at at rock bottom prices once, right? So you can keep afloat, but it, it damages your business at the time when when you need when 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 it hurts you the most and you need them to not do that the most. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, competitors, I think another challenge is, is uh, your prospects and customers being on hard times um, changes their behavior. Um, sure. You know, I was just talking to a, a, a beer field salesman the other day who, who uh, it's been a, and all the, all the bars are closed, right? So it's been a really hard year for their business and they're you know looking for other places to sell beer, but it's their customers, their customers being closed, you know, being closed because they have to be, um, it has been bars being closed has, has been really tough on them for the last year. And, and uh, so they're, you know, those those customers, you know, not, not able to, to engage, not wanting to meet in person, not wanting to purchase things. And if someone didn't want to engage in a sales cycle with you, now they have a fantastic excuse, right? Sure. Um, resistance to spending money, right? Your customers just having you know and sometimes these spending freezes can come from the top right like they uh, and if they can't spend money they can't do business with you um aggressive procurement departments you know leveraging the down economy to you know get discounts and better terms and generally jam down your margins right and right 
you know, I think, how do you combat these things? I think you, you have to make sure. That was my right. next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that, now that we've painted the doom and gloom for some of us, now, how do you, how do you, as a, as a startup CEO or as, as a business leader, how do you combat that? Where do you go from there? Well, I think you, you first have to make sure you're asking the right questions up front during the discovery process, right? You have to, you have to make sure that you understand the value that your customers are going to get from your solution. And then you have to make sure that you can put that value into, you have to be able to communicate it in terms of actual dollar value to get down to like the ROI level. You've got to tie any proposals you make then later in the sales cycle back to back to that value that you, that you've already communicated. And then, then when they're asking for concessions in, in, in the end game of a sales cycle, you, you can then point back to that ROI and back to that agreement that you had that, the, you know, when, when you got them nodding their heads saying, yeah, I mean, this, this makes a ton of sense financially because of this, this, and this, you can point back to that and then you can hold, hold firm on your price as opposed to uh, needing to buckle when they, when they really turn on the heat. Um, but you have to gather that type of information late, uh, very early in the sales process because they're not going to give it to you uh, when once the negotiation starts because it's 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 too transparent what you what you're trying to do if you're if you start trying to walk them through an ROI analysis while you're actually kind of late in the sales cycle like during the negotiation when they're like I'd like a discount you're like well let's talk about how much we're worth it's it's a harder time to talk about that but 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 you can't point back. Um, so I, I think it's also worth you know ta- taking uh, like an, another thing you can do if you're a, a sales manager or or a salesperson you can take a look at what the best reps around you are are doing from a negotiation perspective to to win in in, in difficult times you can look at what they're doing to bring their deals across the line right. you can learn from them you can you can you can learn from how they're doing it and then you can replicate it in your own sales cycles uh, you in in uh, and then, and, and you know, you can even you can ask uh, if you're a sales manager. I would ask a great rep on your team to to lead the negotiation training for the rest of the team, right? If someone's really good at something, have them. And that kind of goes for for any sales skill, really. Like find people who are great at it and put it, put them in front of the room, give them the leadership opportunity, and uh, help them develop the rest of the team. But I think a little negotiation training does, would go a long way for almost any sales team right now. Um, and what, whether you have to, whether you do it in house, whether you bring someone in from the outside, right? Um, you you want to build reps' confidence in in dealing with the professional negotiators that they that sit across the table from them. And if they're dealing, if they're dealing with a higher level decision maker, that person didn't get there by being a bad negotiator. <laughs> so, so you know, it's it's. I think you're a hundred percent right there. In fact, I was looking. I don't know if you've ever heard of um, Chris Voss. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, they I never actually, split yeah. the difference. I was going to take one of those courses just to see. I was going to do one of his weekend classes just because I read the book and I was like, now this is a different type of negotiations than I've ever been exposed to. You know, uh, he he uh, he. I had him on my, on my podcast, and it, it is the it was the most watched podcast I've ever made. Like I put him on YouTube, and uh, it was it usually. I mean, I get like you know, 500 views on a YouTube video. Most, most of our interaction with, with our listeners is over the, over the podcast platforms, but his, his video got 25,000. Uh, and I, this is the last time I checked. I have no idea what it is now. This is months ago or something. It, it was 25,000 downloads, but he, he was so, or watches, I guess, on YouTube. He, he, he is, he's really good. And, uh, he's a really sharp guy. I, I really enjoyed talking with him, but, um, if you if you uh, if you wanted to just get like a little sample of what he what he talks about and what he trains, um, it's like an hour hour long podcast, and he goes through a ton of really valuable things. It's it's episode number fifty. Um, number fifty. Will you write that down, Hudson? Because I'll 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 go back and watch that. And we'll share it too. Um, yeah, the, the name of my podcast is uh, Outside Sales Talk. So outside you, Sales Talk. Yeah, it's on. So all anybody the listening. Yeah, anybody listening, if you you caught that outside sales talk is the name of Steve's podcast, and obviously, if he's having guys like Chris Voss on there, then he knows what he's doing, and and it would be a worthwhile one to subscribe to for sure. So, well, at least listen to that one episode. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a really, it's a really good one. <laughs> Everyone's like, "Oh no, another podcast! I've already had six. Uh, right. <laughs> Oh, that is so funny, man. 
If you've been tuning into the Sales Podcast for any number of episodes, here's what we know. One, we're grateful for you and honored you're listening. Two, you're already in the right mindset to learn more about the openings for our sales career, powered by the very principles we teach right here on this show. Exclusive territories, industry-leading app volume, and a culture of support are just a few key highlights that position this career beyond the ordinary. Learn more today at consolidatedcareers.com. So I, one of the questions that, that I was toying with asking you, and it has to do with relationships and, and people, sales force or, or you know, people on outside sales, whatever, but how do you think going through, coming out of this pandemic, it's... I think it's changed the world forever. I think we're gonna we're gonna things are gonna be different. Um, I, I gave up on going back to normal. Like everything went catastrophic on like March fifteenth for us, and by March seventeenth, I had already given up on anything ever being normal again because it had to open me up to being to change. Like like I'm not gonna hope is not a strategy to me. <laughs> so. So I was like, we got to shift gears, we got to change, and however this ends up, we're gonna we're gonna do it. But one of the things that um, that I that I saw that you're good at is coaching people on on the relationship. How does that relationship change from from client, customer, salesperson? How has this whole thing shifted? Well, I I, I think uh, I think you were very you were very precious. You're, you're, you're good at seeing into the future if you knew that, uh, you, you know, things were never going to go back to normal, right? And and I think, right. you know, I, I think in a lot of ways, they never will. In some ways, they will, you know, I mean, the world is is opening back up and, and things are starting to feel a lot more normal. And so it kind of depends on on what element. I think some things have culturally changed forever and, and uh and, you know, and there's a lot of things that are different, like people going back to offices and stuff. We're trying to figure that out right now. And big companies are, are, are announcing, yeah, we said we were going to be all remote, but we realized that's, we realized it's not that efficient. And so we're bringing people back. And so, um, and, you know, in field, you know, the people that I work with the most field sales people, they've, a lot of them have been the original remote employees, right? They, they've, right. uh, they've been remote forever because, you know, there's a center central office and then we've got our 50 salespeople scattered across the country or the world. And, um, you know, I, I was always a remote employee in, in field sales. Um, everyone else is just catching up to us. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this was just normal for me coming from outside sales. I was like, well, this is, this is what we do. Yeah. Right. right? I mean, that's the, that's it. We're, so we're, we, we got to be a little more, we, we were used to this from the beginning, but it, it was really new for a lot of people to not go into an office every day, right? But I, I mean, how do, how do relationships change? Um, well, I, I think, you know, everyone talks about empathy right now and how you have to be empathetic. And I think that's kind of, that's pretty obvious. I think the, you know, the, the good news there is we all have one more thing in common, right? Um, right? But it is a harder time for relationship building just on the balance. I think, uh, you know, people feel less trust and today there's less customer loyalty. I think, you know, when you, when you can't, you know, for a field salesperson, for example, the people I deal with, if, if you can't get face to face, I think one of the challenges are you, you, there's less, there's less of a relationship. Sales cycles become longer. Uh, I think when, when your customers can't all get in the same room, if it's a complex sales cycle and you're used to having six people get in the same room, when they can't do that, that also extends a sales cycle, right? Uh, we have to, so that's something we have to work against. And, and uh, I think one key way you can do that that comes to mind is to leverage your sponsor. And, and you need, meaning you need someone to be your eyes and ears inside, inside of the organization during the entire sales cycle, right? And, okay. and we always needed this to be successful, right? But especially now, and especially if you have a complex sales cycle, you really need to leverage the person on the inside that wants to purchase your product. And, right. you know, when you're in a, when you're in a sales cycle with a, with a big company, you, this, this person that really wants the thing that you're talking with on a, on a regular basis, they're rarely the only decision maker, right? I mean, sometimes you you find right. yourself in a great situation where you're, you're talking to the CEO and they don't answer anybody and they are acting alone. And, but that, that's rare, right? Usually it's like, well, this team is purchasing this, the marketing team is purchasing this, or the sales team, right? The, the engineers, whoever it is, but there's, and then this person, you know, like controls the purse strings 
and 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 purse strings are are really tight for a lot of organizations right now not all but a lot and um one strategy there how to how, how you can get your sponsor to help you out is you can have a meeting before the meeting with them and you can sit sure. down with them over the phone or, or or zoom or whatever and and have have walk through things with them to try to discuss what's going on uncover what objections they think you're going to encounter when you have the meeting with the larger group um with the other decision makers and influencers so that that, that way you can understand what, the, what objections are coming so that then you'll be better prepared to address them and, and you might want to prepare them in that pre-meeting call to to bring up certain key points like ask certain questions for example to, to facilitate discussion and make sure you're naturally able to cover um the things that are really important to to get out in front of everybody it, the relationship with a sponsor is just so much more important when you're pitching remotely i think because you you've you can't read the room you can't get all the information that right you used to get in a face-to-face -face solution uh, situation right you you can't read people's you can't read fred's body language who's the cfo over there and the, you know in the in the far corner of the table you can't see how he's leaning back and crossing his arms when you, when you right. come to one point so so you don't know oh that's he's got an issue right here this is something we got to talk about um so you have to have your your sponsor uncover this information uh for you and and also just kind of they can better because they already have relationships in place with these people they can have those like chit chatty conversations um, they've already got the rapport uh, built with these people uh, and you might not be able to get the same relationship in place today that you were able to get, you know, when you could take everybody out for a steak dinner. Right. So, but right. The, the sponsor already has that relationship with these people. Um, so you can, you can have them follow up with certain decision makers or influencers and, and get genuine feedback. What, the, what's this person really thinking and you can have them do that for you on your behalf if they want the thing that you sell. And then you can t you can leverage that information to move the deal through the sales cycle towards closure. That's right. Um, it's, it's fascinating that you mentioned the not being able to be face to face because it's amazing how much we rely on nonverbal cues and the and and the nonverbal communication that we get sitting around that table or sitting with somebody. And I really hadn't thought of it until you were just talking about leveraging that sponsor, that, that pre-meeting before that meeting and, and the questions and the, the digging and the things that you have them bring up, you can actually set them up to look really good in front of all their peers as well. So that, so that they're not only want to, they not only want your product in their organization, they want you in that organization because, because you, helped highlight what they were good at or make them look special in front of in front of you know their organization where they live and breathe and interact with all those people and have those relationships that is good I guess somebody needs to be taking some damn notes um, <laughs> <laughs> um but uh but that's really good um you know i had some stuff here written down I wanted to see what what kind of trends you're seeing in this post-COVID world for a field salesperson. What are some of the things you're seeing coming? Things that are things that are here now, and then and then, you know, what you see coming in the future. Like what are what are what are your uh, what's your take on it? Well, um, you know that it's it's hard to it's hard to look look into the future and look into a crystal ball and, and see what the what's what the world's going to look like in a year post COVID. I mean, I, I think for field salespeople, I guess I'm in kind of a unique position because I can see the data on, you know, 5000 companies that are using Badger Maps with their field sales teams. I can so I can see that their meetings are down right now. It's harder to get meetings right. uh, with with customers. I think that's a a key thing that's driving things today and, and kind of and it's unclear how far that's going to go forward but i think you know that's we're definitely seeing around so it's around a 20 percent decline in meetings with customers compared to today even though the world's you know largely opened up it's mid-june wow. um so 20 percent fewer meetings today than there was pre-covid right and, and and that has been unevenly distributed right so right some industries have just been 
you know, effectively ground, we're, we're, especially in the depths of COVID, we're, we're ground to a standstill, right? They laid off right. their company, you know, they sell beer to bars or uh, they sell, uh, you know, um, exercise equipment to gyms like these. There are certain industries that were just ground to a halt, right? Right. And they laid off their sales teams, furloughed them or the company went bankrupt. But, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, some companies that, you know, they were still biz in business, they, they're still employing their sales teams. And it was just it's kind of it was biz more business as as usual in terms of how many how many meetings they were getting with their customers. Right. Um, you know, and, and a lot of industries are essential, right? So, you know, uh, you know, a medical device rep that's they're they're probably getting a similar number of meetings, and they're you know they're able to meet with the doctors and sell. Sure. You know, if you sell shoulder joints, just as many shoulders are going bad at the same rate, right? So I think they were doing their sales calls while they're practicing social distancing, distancing, etc. Right. But the right. Uh, in the midterm and 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 certainly. Um, the long term, I think we'll see a lot of things come. We, we have seen a lot of things come back and we'll continue to see that trend as you look out into the future. I think, you know, more and more just comes back and, you know, gyms open up, but they are, they are opening up right now in many parts of the country yeah. they are already opened up. Um, right. You know, beer, beer is getting sold to bars again. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I suspect that uh, as we look into the future, um, there will be cultural changes that will have occurred, but largely things will 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 go back to normal in terms of most business cycles. And I think this is this has damaged some industries more than others. It's helped some industries um, even, but on on the balance, a, a lot of things will will go back to the way they were. Yeah, I um, it's fascinating. Because with you talking about how some industries ground to a halt, some industries, some industries did even better uh, just by the nature of the beast and what they were doing. I mean, if they were producing medical masks before, they put it on steroids over the last 18 months, you know. But but the the fascinating thing that I noticed, um, even by March 17th, when I said that I, I, you know, knew it wouldn't go back to normal. And I want to see how what your thoughts are on this. Because in my organization, I have a lot of different salespeople and I had some and not many people would talk about this, but I, I started talking about it early on. I had people that are like so far on the right side of the fence, like they this was the largest overreach of government power and, you know, civil war was around the corner. And then I had people all the way on this other side that thought that, you know, every, it was going to be a walking dead scenario and COVID was going to kill everybody and, to, and it was going to be a zombie apocalypse. Like I had everything in between. And, and, and I mean, and, and, and I get it. Like nobody knew what was going on and everybody's going to fall to, to whatever it is they think or know, or the information they've put their hands on. And, 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 but what I realized there is that fear was driving both. Fear was driving both. And that fear in and of itself shuts off action. And the only cure for fear is action. And so that was my biggest, it took 90 days for me to get just simple things being done in the field um, for people to, to, to start moving again and doing and, and creating action. And, that, and it would overcome the fear, whatever that fear was. Like, I didn't care. You know, if somebody wanted me to wear a hazmat suit because they lived with their grandmother and they didn't want them to get sick, great, I'll wear a hazmat suit. Doesn't matter to me. Or if somebody want like, I'm. It, it had nothing to do with what was going on. I saw my enemy last year was fear, and and so moving through that, um, and then some of these whole industries that were in a sense disappearing. Like I was worried for the restaurant industry myself because I love to eat out, you know, um, but but watching people come back we had to redesign what we thought were the norms and so when you tell me that people were that the meetings were 20 percent down i knew that that was going to be the case but i had to go in and redesign like if it took a hundred phone calls to get 10 meetings before just know it's a thousand now like it's a thousand, just erase what you knew before and know that we're going to have to do whatever we have to do to set up whatever it is. And so 
I would imagine your business, Badger Map, I would imagine you guys are growing at an exponential rate because if someone has a sales team out there capturing 10 more hours a week for a salesperson, um, I mean, I know CEOs that would sacrifice their firstborn for that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I'm, not really, but you know what I'm saying? Like that's a that's super significant. So I wanted to spit all that out and then go, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think efficiency is, is so important right now. And um, that's, uh, you know, we, we help field sales people be more efficient. And, that, and it is, it, it, during COVID was a very slow time for us because a lot of our was customers it? were getting, were furloughing their sales teams or just shutting right. down. Um, and, and really, we saw two sides of that coin, right? Like there were customers that did really well. There were customers that just got killed by this. And right. um, I guess now we're kind of where uh, we, we, so I, I guess during COVID, we really just stopped growing. And we've always been like a, a, a high growth software company, but we just, right. there was an initial drop, you know, and back, you know, last March, April, May, and then things just leveled off because we were acquiring a bunch of new customers in essential industries. And, and in industries where people needed to still be out there, but be more efficient. Right. Um, and, and suddenly they, they cared that much more about like, how much time is this taking us to design our routes for the day and figure out who we're gonna see and in what order and move things around. And how, how, much, how much would it help us to focus on the right customers given where we were in our territory that day? Like how, how, how helpful would that be? Because we, we really needed a boost in productivity and efficiency right now. It's not it's not the time to waste time right um, they started asking the correct questions and that helped you probably after the initial you know catastrophic 90 days or whatever yeah and so we were able to acquire a whole bunch of new customers even even so we were losing some industries and some com some customers but then we were gaining new ones but overall the company was very flat until uh the beginning of 2021 and then this this has been a, a great year for us but uh you know, because as people have gotten to go back into the field, we've had those people coming back. And also um, just because it's a tougher economy for a lot of people, they do care that much more about being efficient with their field sales team. And so they are signing up uh, for, for the product. So it's been, a, this has been a good year. Last year was a very tough year. Same. <laughs> I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to repeat it, but one of the things one of the things that i was super grateful for on new year's eve was i looked back over the year and i thought you know what this was i mean this was a terrible terrible year but it forced us to ask the questions and forced us to grow in the areas that put us development wise sales wise uh, recruiting wise tactic wise it put us five years ahead even though that's not reflected in the revenue right now. And so I was grateful for that, but I was excited to begin a new year, <laughs> you know, but that's a, that's a fascinating thing that yours went through from what you're saying, you went through almost identical to, to how it was with us as well. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's, at least you've all got something in common here, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. The, the world all kind of, the whole world went through a very similar situation, I think, over the past year. And, and I right. think it did make people more empathetic and more um, more aware of uh, of our fellow man and, and how yeah. all our problems are intertwined, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had a few um, salespeople that would get into it on social media and argue their points or whatever. And so in one of my trainings, I was like, look, how you're never going to convince anybody arguing with them online. I was like, how about we just this year, let's take a step back and just be humankind, right? Be both human and kind and just and just be nice. And I think you're right. The empathetic. Um, I think that muscle has grown worldwide over the last year, <laughs> which is important. But one of my, my last question to you, in your own words, how would you define a sales wolf? A sales wolf? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, for me, the, uh, the most important thing is, is, is curiosity, right? And, uh, 
and I, I think that you know the best salespeople are are really curious and they ask the right questions and they are able to kind of get get to the deeper get to deeper relationships with people and and really deeper understanding of their business their problems their situation um and i think you know the an important thing uh you know when you, when you talk about a sales wolf a key thing about a, the wolves is that they're pack animals right they, they work on a team and a lot of right. people think that uh, a salesperson is a lone wolf out there doing things alone but they're the the best sales people really their team players, you know, they know how to pass the ball around. They know how to leverage their teammates. They know how to, they know how to bring in, um, leverage the asset of the organization that they're in. You know, they know how to work with marketing to to bring in resources. They know how to, you know, leverage their manager. They know how to manage leverage the 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 other parts of their organization that can help them get deals done, and right. uh, and I think that's that's the thing that we can. You know, most learn from the wolf is the wolf doesn't take down a, a caribou alone. It, it it takes it down with five other people. That's right. Five other five other right. wolves. And in this case, they 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 right. they they run the they run it down. They work together. They're very they're very they they move uh, in, synchronous synchronously in synchronicity. <laughs> hey, I understand. <laughs> you don't even have to say that right. Remember, I'm. From South Carolina, so both of those make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, we're allowed to just make up our own words in English. I, that's I, 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 I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. Well, at Steve, why don't you share all of the different places, social media wise, books, anything that you want to share where people can find you? Um, I want people to be able to find you, find Badger Maps, be able to reach out to you, comment, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I mentioned my podcast. That's a good place to like hear from me. Like, so outside sales talk um, is the name of that. Uh, if it's Badger, if you're in field sales and it's Badger that you're interested in, definitely just check out the website badgermapping.com um, and you kind of get a, a feel for the different things we help field sales people do. In, in fact, uh, just for that, we have a discount code. If you could just go to badgermapping.com forward slash podcasts, you get like a you know, two months free on the product so you know there there's a, a reward for listening to me blather on here <laughs> but, <laughs> but but uh it, if it's me personally you're looking to connect with um uh linkedin is probably one of the better places to catch me uh yeah. so just look up steve benson badger maps and you'll be able to find me but yeah Perfect. that's uh uh awesome. those, those, that's the list i think of the best places to get hold of me best places to get you, man. I really appreciate you um, you being on here and you have a lot of great insight and I'm looking forward to continuing our relationship uh, post this call. But um, for everybody listening, if you get anything out of this podcast and this one will be on, on Steve's podcast as well, make sure you subscribe to him, subscribe to this, share it. And, uh, and let us know what you're getting out of it. Let us know what you want to hear. Uh, if there's something you're struggling with in sales, if there's something you're struggling with relationship wise, um, because all sales are, are relationships. All, everything we do in this life is relationship based. And so let us know what the topics you want to hear and we'll make sure that we seek out uh, experts in their field, just like Steve and have them on here. So, hey, I appreciate you being on here and um, Looking forward to catching up with you more, and I'm definitely going to uh, check out Badger Mapping for sure. <laughs> so, thank you, man. Outstanding. Well, hey, thanks for having me on the show. It's been great to great to chat with you here. Absolutely. Look forward to talking soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.